So without further ado, let's give her a hand of welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a very nice time for me to come again and talk about themes that I really love. Uh, I could just go for on and on and on, but I know we don't have all the time. So I'm just going to read right there into the a talk that I'm going to be sharing with you today and some facts about it and how that influences the way that we live here in Boquete. So we're going to talk about Boquete itself, the geography, the topography, and then we'll talk about the history and population. And then uh, we kind of wrap up a little bit on what it means for, for us now and what would be that we could guess, if we could guess the future. We, we cannot guess, but we live with faith, that's all. All right, so let's start with this picture. This picture is um, the real size of the different continents. So you can see that Panama, even though it seems to be a big, a small country, is not that small. But it has a very particular position, geographical position, in, in this whole map right there in the middle. But we can see just between the, the North and South America continents. And that creates a very particular interaction that forms the microclimate that we enjoy here in Boquete. And that is the most famous one now because of the way that it affects the coffee, as it is known as the terroir. Okay, but we also live in this kind of world. If somebody could guess what that world is. This is the different plates that forms the earth. And when you see all this uh, ring of fire and all that little uh, yellow dots, it really means the places where we are going to have earthquakes, tremblers, because of the plates, the way that they move. And as you can see, well, Panama is just in the middle of one, two, three, four plates. And that's why once in a while we, we feel it here. But how is this going? And then we discover there is a different thing when we go closer to it. And one particular one that I just discovered for you with all the latest uh, movement that we had, I did some research and see what was out there about Panama. And what happens is that now, yes, we are between the bigger plates, but I discovered that there are micro plates and Panama is on top of the whole micro plate. So it's not cut. So we are not in, on top of a cut which could happen in other areas. Panama is in reality on top of a little table. So when he moves, he moves everywhere. So it moves in, that's what I've always thought, why we feel a tremor here, it can be felt in Panama City. Well, that's not, I understand now why it is. It is because this little, it receives all the, the shakes from the big, bigger ones, and then it just translates them through us. Since we have these plates coming in this way, the bigger ones are coming this way against Panama, and then Panama is the little top there, then we get all this movement. Interesting facts that I just thought I will share with you. Okay, this is in reality our country. It's a very narrow one. Where we are located is closer to the Caribbean Sea than we are to the Pacific. And that's why we get the famous Pajareque because the Pajareca is no more than the push of the winds coming on top of the mountain range. And Boquete is located just there, in the volcano system, volcano system. This is the Baru volcano, and Boquete is right in the middle there. Then we have Dolega, David, and then we have Concepcion. Those four points are very interesting in the way that we interact and what creates the habitat that we have. Okay. So let's talk about a little bit about this, our volcano. What you see here is the expected impact if the volcano goes off. Now, you guess that the last time that they have the previous uh, eruption, it went to the western side, it didn't come this way. That's what you see in the map, even in these little big maps, little maps of Panama, you see that over there, where Volcan is, and down below Cerro Punta, it will really just went down, uh, basically the volcano just went down that way. It's almost the same way that St. Helens in the, uh, well, Washington State, that just went on the side, same effect here. So we didn't get as much 
from that part. And because the winds most of the time comes north-south or north going southwest, then it was taking the influence of that, uh, all the, the fumes and all the other effects that happens with the volcano just went that, that way. But previously, we had had here a major, a major change because of the eruption of the volcano. It has been said that the, it's, it's a kind of volcano that doesn't give, um, it, it does uh, provide a pyroplastic and lahars. It doesn't do lava. So it's, very, it's another type of volcano. And the one that we had here, and you see all the pink part, is where the lahar and the pyroflog, pyroplastic flow came when it came. And that's what you could see. Let's see if I have it here. Yes, there it is. So that's Boquete. So guess what Boquete is settled on? It's exactly on the pink, pink part. That's Boquete. And you can see the cuts that happens even, and the big, big flow came from down the, in the corner there, all the way here, and then just created the whole part of the valley. That's when they happened, the big one that came this side. It's been said that, uh, that the volcano will go off every 500 years to 750 years. That's the life of the volcano. It's a, it's a very young volcano, and it's active. That's what we know now. Well, that's what I know now. I, I do remember one time when I was a little, but maybe five years old, and there were so many tremors happening in Boquete that people started leaving the town. In fact, my family left the town too, because we just were afraid. With technology, we now can just follow up in a more precise way, so we don't have to be guessing. But in the memory that we had from before was, okay, if it is, you get more than 34, 40 tremors through the day, leave. That's a good advice. If you are not, no, something, just, just leave. Anyways, let's go a little bit into the history. Now that we understand about geography, topography, and where we are located and why, let's talk about the history in time. What we have here is a little map that I just put together to, to see some historical timeline. So we have, uh, Panama was discovered in 1501, when the Spaniards came this way. 1502 was when uh, Christopher of Columbus came. And then in 1513 is when the Pacific Ocean was discovered. And it was discovered that route that you see there. It was not on this other route. And just after 1513, Six years it took to the Spaniards to discover Chiriquí. So Chiriquí was discovered in 1519, which meant that the Spaniards went all the way down to Peru and all the way up to Acapulco and to California. The first town that we have here in Chiriquí was Remedios. It was 1589. The second one was Alange, where Concepcion is. That was 1591. And then we have Dolega, just below here, 1635. So we have a quite a story to tell about the, the population that we have around, where we're coming from. This is a very interesting map, which is, uh, you might not see all from down there, but here what it shows is what is happening in different parts of the world when we look from 1400 to 2000, 2025, that's basically the whole uh, map. And what it does is that really help us to understand, uh, for instance, the Baru Volcano took place uh, when the Spaniards came here, they, there was no volcano eruption, because there is no written account of that, which means that it took place, this is 1400, it took place sometimes around here. So that's when the volcano took, uh, erupted, and the people fled from here. So when the Spaniards came, Indians were coming back. And that's why you see some of the Indian settlements were not in Panama are not so close to the volcano, because they had a memory, an oral history, that tell, well, it does make something. 
Okay, so that's happened here. Spaniards came here, this is the first line. That's what the Spaniards came. And it tells you here, okay, what is happening? The first circumnavigation in the world happens here with Magellan. So we have discoveries going on this. Oceania, Africa, Japan, China, India, Persia, Middle Europe, Russia, North America, and Latin America. So it gives us an idea. Now that we can do it using this, that you can find out what is happening everywhere. I mean, in fact, we are receiving too much information, basically, of all over the world. This was help us to understand, okay, how many years it took to develop something. So we were talking about, okay, pretty much here, pretty much here is when Chiriqui was discovered. Here we have when uh, Dolega, the city of Dolega was uh, founded. And then we have here settlements coming into Boquete around this time. So what happens with Boquete? Boquete had the first wave of people coming back to Boquete were the Indian, Indians because they were the ones who were before, they fled. Now, after maybe 50 years or 100 years before, they start coming back. So when the Spaniards arrived here, and they settled the towns here, they found already tribes of Indians here. And then from here to here, then we have development of the population. But many things that happened during those times. For instance, in this period, we have a massive amount of gold and silver going from Latin America, the Spanish colonial empire, into the world, meaning Europe that got almost all the gold. And I was surprised to discover where the silver went. The silver went to China because there was a lot of trade taking place between the Europeans and China. So to understand that, then we can understand why the Spaniards and the English people and all these other ones wanted to do to come to America to discover gold, to discover uh, new silver mines. And that all that went through Panama. That's why we have also the people that we have here. Because when people, yes, 1850, right here, gold rush. And that point, a railroad was built in the what is the Panama Canal now, to cross. And then when you have that, you also have ships going through Chiriqui, because they are going north via Pacific. So we have then Indians, then we come here, people that are descendants of Spanish or Indian coming into Boquete. Into 2000, we have expats coming into Boquete. 1914, we have another wave of coming through Boquete. It was the third wave. And the 14th was because uh, of the Panama Canal. With the Panama Canal, there were so many, remember that at that time there was not much technology and most of the work had to be done by labor force. I don't remember, quite remember, there were half of like uh, 60,000 people working to build the canal, something like that. It was a huge amount of people. When you get a huge amount of people, what do you need? Food, you need to produce all sorts of things happening that will support that. So it created also in the whole country of Panama a lot of movement of what they will need and be provided, and also they will stay in Panama. Yes, most of them moved, but some of them stayed. And Boquete was also a recipient of them for two reasons. Scientific research, because people were studying the volcano, the volcano area. And also was because Boquete is beautiful even though we are in the pink area. So, um, interesting enough here is that when I see the different movement economic influx that created uh, the, the money, the gold, and the silver going into the world, then we also have the trade, is when coffee started moving from uh, the Arabic area into the world. And coffee came into America, as a plantation around this time, around this time. And it came to Boquete right here. But that gives you a good sense of where we are in the history. And one thing that I discover is, okay, if we had the eruption taking place here, what is it gonna be next? Clock is ticking. 
And that's why there have been some interest in setting uh, devices right now on the volcano to mo start monitoring it, because it's, it's the span of time that is uh, saying the historical recount. So, so that's the future in that sense. All right, and here we have, we are right there in the path of our beautiful volcano, right there. You can see it right there. When it came out, it just moved there. And then we have the other towns, and because of the winds, as you saw in this picture, because of the winds, the impact is going to be this way. All this area will have the impact of it. Let's see if I am very good with technology here, because I was trying this last night, and it seems to work, but now I don't know here. Let's see if we can go and see if we can do it. This is a pyroplastic flow. And it will do the same exact Something thing that it triggers a pyroplastic flow about 10 times bigger than all that came before. And it just, and this is a natural moments, it overwhelms the valley. frame of that happening. And this was in Japan, I think. And it is very fast. This is very fast. These people will not make it here. Never. But what was interesting about this is that you will see now what is happening. And it's what, two minutes, maybe? This is started out there. By the time but a then TV camera in I the thought, it's quite interesting. It's gonna, it's gonna just wipe up everything. But look what happened now. That's the wind. That's the strength of the wind. You see? It just, poof. Move it in another direction. Okay, good for for the. That's it. Okay, that was good. So now I understand what it means. So those are the things that we do now. We train and we teach the people all these little things that we will have to get ready for. Uh, I think that in Japan only what four people died in that one. And because they, they, they just never thought that it was going to be that fast. But they were already prevented of that, so all the people had to be moved. So that's what we have to expect to happen sometime. Ah, next 150 years, so 2021, 2200 maybe, this will happen. Okay, let's go keep going. Okay, that's the beautiful boquete that was uh, in... Uh, Early 19, or middle 19, 1950 maybe, the railroad, uh, the new road coming in, the railroad came into Boquete in 1916. So Boquete was a quite advanced town. When you have roads and roads and transportation, it moves. These two lanes, four lanes that we had, well, we're going to have visitors every other 20 minutes, something like that. What is interesting about this picture is, can you find the Caldera River? It's not in the picture, because it's all the way to the other side. But it also shows that it's the formation that was created by the river. So all this that you see there is the pink area. OK. And this is what it is today. Is it still? We see the pet, but then the river has moved from closer to the mountains all the way here. The railroad area, the railroad would be right through here. You see these towns would be this here. And the previous picture, railroad is here, and no river. I do recall one, okay, why does this happen? And this is another thing that we need to learn about Boquete. My grandfather used to say, never build something besides the river, at least here in Bukit. So move away from the river. Why? Because we have water pockets on the mountains. We could have water pockets in the volcano. Where you see lakes on top of you, just don't be in the way of that one. 
because it will go down. That's the water. So we need to understand what it is that we need to be looking into. Keep the, any area of the rivers clean on the top part. So it doesn't create kind of small lakes, beautiful lakes, of course. But when they open, it comes down very fast. If you notice, here in Boquete, we have a recuperation of rivers in uh, maybe in an hour and a half. You can see the river totally, totally full of dirt. And an hour and a half is totally clean because of the speed. So we need to understand, OK, as we understand now what a pyroplastic movement is, we need to understand what it is, what we call the head. And you will call a flash flood coming in. It will just come. So that's another thing that we need to be looking into. And the other part that we have here, then, is um, the area that we started to work here. It was uh, the arrived people here in Boquete in uh, 1895. Is when we had the first. At least my family came in 1895, and. Uh, main activity was coffee. And that's why you can still see a lot of greens, because if coffee is a tree. So that's one part that has helped the town to be as green as we are, and have as much tree as we have. If we go to cattle business, you see what happens. You clean up. Uh, if you go to vegetables, same thing. But the people that came here in the 1800s, they decided to do coffee because they were Colombians. Most of the coffee that people that came here, they brought because they understood about coffee industry. And that's why they started the coffee here. And everybody that all came in, we just do the same. And then when we have in 1914, um, the people that came from the Panama Canal, what did they do? Coffee. So we have all been based on coffee and oranges. And those are trees. We have become a very nice buffer zone against the uh, biodiversity and nature that we have. Then, what I'm going to present here. Is one of the things we realized in the early 90s was that no one knew that Panama produced coffee. People were asking us, yeah. so you guys grow coffee in Panama? We thought it was just a uh, canal. It was one of the best kept secrets of the world. What goes into your daily cup of coffee? And what is that worth? Far more goes into producing your cup of coffee than you can imagine. The prices were very depressed, so it was not a profitable business. We were losing the business. And the question was, what are we going to do? There was a sensation of failure. Coffee was, wasn't going to make it. We had to do something. But about this time, the concept of specialty coffee began catching on a coffee that tasted good. The most famous of these pioneering roasters was Alfred Peet, the visionary Dutch-American who opened Peet's Coffee, Tea, and Spices in Berkeley, California in 1966. Nobody in Panama knew how to roast. We didn't even have a roaster. We understood that we didn't understand coffee. Then what was the next step? We need to learn how to cut it. At that time, I started to learn uh, to cut with the million boot. So we'll say, well, if this happens in, in wine, maybe we can make it happen in coffee. This is the way we either make it or we don't make it. Thank you very much for your attention. I invite you when you have the time to watch this uh, documentary that we put together in order to recall the history of what made the specialty coffee here in, in Boquete and with the people that started the movement. So for now, I think that we can open for questions and answers. Okay, I think that I almost made it like... How do you see the impact of the, of the big migrations into Bolchetti? Um First of all, like the North American <laughs> migration starting in maybe 2000, and now we have, um, well then we had uh, uh, evangelicals that came in about 2010, maybe, mm -hmm. and then uh, now we have the South Africans coming. 
this last couple of years. How do you see that influencing the, the culture in the future? Uh, the first thing that we need to understand is that Boquete has always been a place where it has been welcoming people. That's what happened. It's been, and the other part that you always notice here in the area is that there is a culture of respect. Sort of, okay, the Indians could be Indians, just let them be, and then we just do some interaction, yes, but they are Indians. Uh, the locals are local, so the locals keep themselves kind of a binge with the local, which is understandable why. Uh, uh, and also happens with the people that came. You remember the first wave uh, that came in, uh, I do remember what was that, the beginning of 1900? Uh, well, the same thing. They were together, they will join together. The Americans, the expats, the, the, everybody was not from the locals. The locals meaning the ones that came from Dolega because those were the locals, the 200 years of history of population in Dolega. So these when they came were the outsiders. They came, and then they kind of met together. They did something interesting. If you look into the history, they blended with the people. So they married people, and they have the families here. They married local women, and they created the family, so they integrated in the, here. Uh, in Dolega, it happened the same thing. Remember that all the Spaniards that came to colonize were men. There were no women there. And it says the legend that the, the chief here, the Indian chief, realized that the Spaniards were three times bigger than them. They had more powerful, they had all the weapons, but they didn't have women. So that's what we descend. My descent is pure Spaniards and Indian. Well, that's where we exist, because you have to keep living. So those things, what it does, it's impact. Now, what happens with the 2000? It was a little bit different, because who came? The retired. All people. They have different needs than the, lo the normal population. You had more health issues. We have more health issues when we get older, all of us. But the distribution was different. Your impact of the economy, we had inflation right away. Why? Because you are not part of the, e the economy. The economy is when you produce and you earn from that production here. No. Where you come here, you are retired, you have no problem with the income. The income is a fixed one. I mean, it doesn't belong to the economy that is local. So that creates an impact on the economy too. And an impact on the economy for the locals. And the, what happened is that we were, I remember the 2010, around, no, before 2008, we had, I don't know how many banks here. I don't know how many uh, lawyers' offices. And we were like, wow, never we were so important. Well, it had nothing to do with us. It had to do with the influx of money that was from outside coming in. So there is an impact, and we need to understand what kind of impact, what are the needs in order to create balance. Everything is about balance. Everything is about balance. As long as we keep the system in balance and we contribute to the balance, things will go okay. When we have a stretches of the system, is when we need to fix it a little bit and see what we can arrange there. What is happening now, we need to look into what is the kind of population that is coming. Now we are seeing more families. That's a different population with different needs. They need the schools. They need other things. And the other part that is interesting is when the people understand what is the value of the whole microsystem where we live, they start contributing to it. One thing that we used to say is that the Boqueteños are always planting trees. That is something that is in the memory of all of us. We're always planting trees. Orange tree lemon trees, mango trees, even though it's not supposed to be here, but anyways. But when the expats came, what happens? We need to have a nice yard. So where are the trees? Gone. And what happened, why do we take care of the trees? Because we have seen mud sliding, and that for us is dangerous. So we are taking care of our own life. So at, at the end is how we learn all these things that I'm showing to you, a little bit of this, so you could understand, okay? I mean, this is common sense. 
if we need water on the top, it will come down. So we got to make sure that we're taking a good look at what is happening around us and what we, we need to look into. So every time we have a lot of rain, I go to watch the river and I go around. Why? Because we are the ones who need to resolve the issues when there is an issue. There's no time, I mean, with that thing coming down, well, there is no time for the whatever needs to come, the fire people, ah, no, no time. It's us, it's us that are living in there. And that's why the memory of this whole area is so important to learn about, because it's our own life. And it's the life of people that live with us. Okay. Yes, thank you. And uh, a very interesting topic. Thank you, Doctor. Um, does the geological community have a, um, a prediction for, for when the next uh, uh, eruption will take place? No, not really. It is something that we don't, uh, are too concerned about that. Just because of what I said, if it start moving a little bit too, too often, we just leave. And then we come back. So it's more about that type of common sense that we use here. What we will know now, and I learned about this because the, here in Boquete retired a person that is a geologist. And so I took a tour with him and he was explaining to me all these other things. And I thought, wow, I didn't know all that. But there was a science in it there. But when there is no science, you gotta use your common sense and look back into the memory of what had happened before, because people pass it on. It might not tell you that the volcano erupted, it just tells you that when it turns too much, just leave, just leave. So those are things that we need also to pay attention to. It is when you ever come, well, when you come to Rome, do Rome, the Romans, that's what they say. But the same thing, you learn how to do and how we do things here. And it is important to be open to understand the nuances of it. Because sometimes people say, oh, you are too, a little bit too wild. No, oh, it had some sense to do some things. So it's also to pay attention in that sense. Okay. Another question? Comment? Okay. Thank you. Doctor, you said something very important. In, uh, to quickly get back to immigration. Uh, both of us have been immigrants all our lives, more or less, uh, in different countries and diff on different continents. I cannot, I can understand the, or move, move the little bit of the mass because I cannot. Okay, sorry about that. Oh, okay. Now, get back, to get back to the point of immigration, which is a fairly important matter. Um, coming from Europe, we see what's happening if immigrants come not only one by one, that's easy for them to integrate these people into society. Mm -hmm. They're forced to adopt and to do things when in Rome as the Romans do. Here, um, we now see a different type of immigration. They come in masses, not as of yet, but they will come in masses. And how do you keep the balance? How do you anticipate uh, a small country like Panama? Uh, we're from Switzerland, so a small country like Switzerland. How can you keep the balance and make sure that you can kind of preserve the culture of your country? Uh, here, it's going to change, I'm, I'm almost sure. These immigrants don't want to stay here, they want to move northwards. Mm -hmm. So, but some will be forced to stay here. How, how do you anticipate to integrate these people and to keep the balance? There is... Uh First of all, one thing that I have discovered is Panama is a big country, has a lot of area, there are still a lot of places to, to live. If you go to Europe, as you saw there, Europe is a very small area. Well, there are plenty of areas everywhere. Uh, in fact, Holland, I mean, Holland is 16 million people in half the size of Panama. Panama is only four, 4 million people. In fact, we need more people here in a way. If we need to move the economy, we need to move, have more people here. But we are not having any strategy, as you said, about what we are promoting to have as people that we want to come in. Because that's what happens in the United States. That's the way the United States was uh, developed, because you need people to generate, and you need people to consume. And what happens with migration is that sometimes it's uh, unwanted migration. Well, in a way, the, the, the history tells us here is that 
the system will kind of stretch a little bit. Let's say the Indians, the Nova people. Before the 2000 year, the Indians were not staying in Boquete. They will only come to pick coffee and they will leave. After 2000, there was a lot of work that came in because supermarkets were bigger. They needed people to use do the, the arrangement there. And you can see them now, how many people that are Indian that are working everywhere. What happens? One population stretched out the system. The other population responded to it. It's about demand and offer. And it's the role of the economics. It takes some time, yes, of course, it takes some time, but it always finds the movement. The idea is then how we influence that kind of movement by understanding what is happening and how we can just promote the positive side of it. Uh, we had influ uh, migrants coming during the Venezuelan situation. I don't know how many Venezuelans came here. Even we have Venezuelans here in Bukit. But they are also people. They also need, they also have rights. So it's how you negotiate those things, understanding. And most of the time, because we have a memory of how we went when we were migrants. My mother, my mother's family was migrant. They came here to Boquete because here they could find job and they could find a school. But they were born in Dolega, all of them. So we are a history of migrants. Maybe in a short area, but it's still the same. And how do we come here and how you contribute to the economy here? And the economy contributes to yourself too. So when you understand that exchange, then you start using your free will to restrain your free will to be able to survive. Yes. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that as we as gringos think that we're the only immigrants because we don't recognize how many Venezuelans and Colombianos mm -hmm. there are in Bolchetti because to us, we don't hear the difference in the language and so we think they're all Panamanians. But there's a great deal of, of immigrants that come here and many of the laws that Panama passes on immigration are geared towards some of the southern immigrants and not towards us, so we shouldn't get all bent out of shape about that. The other thing, just for your information, I'm talking about the volcano. Um, I have booked two speakers who are going to speak on that, and I think, Dr. Maria, you know them both. Dr. Paul Myers, mm -hmm. who's a retired uh, head of a geology department from a uh, Wisconsin University, studies the volcano extensively, and he will mm -hmm. talk about that. And the other one is a Panamanian guy named Angel Rodriguez. I'm sure you know him mm -hmm. from Volcan. And he monitors both the earthquake mm -hmm. situation and the volcano situation. And he actually builds monitoring equipment mm -hmm. for those things. So they're both going to be really interesting talks. And they're coming up, so watch the schedule. Another question, another comment, right, right here. Hello. Um, so with the recent change in the uh, regulations for the friendly nations visa, making it a little more uh, expensive to come here with a friendly nations visa, isn't that just going to uh, limit the amount of families that are gonna be able to come here? Um, and increase the number of retirees that are here? Well, we got to understand also that, uh, and that's the difference, and, and that's the reality of the life of retirees too, is that uh, it move, it's a population that moves very fast. And what I mean very fast is uh, it's rather 20, 25 years maybe, because after, if I'm retired, I'm 80, uh, 62, 20 years is 82. So then it comes, obviously, some of those will, of us will die before that, and some of us will be a little bit longer. But it's a different shape of the population that when you have a family. When you have a family, you at least have 40 years of life there, of contribution to the economy. So if we look into the differences of 
shape and sizes and ages of the population, including women and men, then we can understand what are the needs. That's what I say. When we have different groups, we have different needs, and the different needs also creates, of course, it's a demand of things. It reshapes the economy. And with that, it makes it different. And now, the idea of with changing laws is because it's not only, I remember when the expats came first, they were using a law that was a lot of advantages that was put in place in order to create more influx of people, retires, into the old Panama Canal zone. It was not to come this way. It was to stay there and to give value and to use all the infrastructure that was there. Because it was an easy way. It's just that the people don't like too much Panama City. Look at this better, I'm sure. And, and of course, we receive them, that part. Now, how do we do, how we do control certain things? I do remember in 2000, 2005, most of the problems that we have, the economics problem, all of the problems that we had with frauds taking place because buying and selling lands, and the, were not from Bocatanians, were from outsiders, because they were the ones who had the money. We didn't have any money. They were the ones who had the money. So they were the ones who come, and they buy, and they will resell. And they will do all sorts of things. So that reshapes the economy of it. Then guess what happened? We were just starting to get a little bit concerned about all this whole, uh, changing all the whole area, beautiful areas, into real estate. Because we didn't have the money. So what? That's, that's pure reality. And what happened is that we started to get concerned, okay, it's going to reshape the whole way that we do things in Bukit. And we have nothing to do about it. We cannot do anything because we cannot control it. We don't have power on it. And then it happened something interesting. You remember what happened in 2008 in the United States? Did it bring problems with, the, with the, all the houses and all that? Many people who were already here had to go back to the States because of that. And they couldn't stay. So right away you saw the, yeah, everything just went off. So these are also realities. And that's why you see it is important to understand what is going on around the world too. It's what is happening now with migration here in Panama City. I mean, not in Panama City, in the border with Colombia. It's amazing. When you see 10,000 people there waiting, what are you gonna do with them? They're still people, still families. So those are not easy things to deal with, but they're still there. So this kind of migration is always a tricky, but also an opportunity. And it is how we take that opportunity to make the most of it. And I do appreciate one uh, good thing that happens in, when I came back from United States after I finished my PhD. Uh, they invited me to the BCP meetings. So I could explain, I give my opinion and, and, and the perspective, just to keep something from, uh, from, from the community. Because it was looked into, okay, if we are in this community, we need to integrate into the community. And I thought that was very nice. That's the way that we integrate. We communicate. We start understanding each other. We start understanding that our needs are different than the ones that are locals. And then we are becoming patient. Because a lot of people were very impatient. Oh, we didn't have the road, we didn't have the water, we didn't, we didn't, and we didn't, and we didn't. That doesn't make any life better. It creates more friction, rather. Oh, we have people complaining that they, I mean, the chickens were too loud, the dogs were too loud. <laughs> now we have some stories about neighbors killing the chickens because there was, or, or the rooster because they were every four and a half in the morning, just kick, 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 kick. <laughs> that's all. And both of them ending up in the mayor's office. But it is what it is. It's, it's we understand it. We cannot have it all. Never. Never. It's that understanding always happens with good communication. I remember that they had this great idea. Let's create a choir. Good. Music is always something that joins people. The problem was that the only ones who were in the choir were the experts. And I said, what? People don't care about this. So some somebody asked me, OK, so why is it that the Bocatenos don't like to sing? You know, they do like to sing. I said, but finally we realized something. I said, when do you have the practice? Well, we practice two times a week at two in the afternoon. 
Oh, great. Yeah. But all of us that are Boqueteños, we have to work in order to survive and to eat. So who's going to go at 2 in the afternoon? It's you. Because for us, we have to do our duty. So they decide, okay, now we understand that. So they move it to 5. But then we had a choir. But it's that communication that helps to create community and understand where we can live and how we can live and with with whom we can live. And the other part I one time was telling you, you know, it's a little bit interesting that as a community that are highly involved with each other, we were feeling a little bit sad. Why? Because we only had this little time with these people and we were not used to. It's like every other week we would have someone that was just going to the cemetery. That's sad. But it's a reality because most of the people that came were older. So it was expected that they would die. And it creates a little bit of a stress on the emotional side. Because then realize that's not a normal population. A normal population, you have all the structure with the little kids and the grandpas and the grandmas and all this. It's all together. But now we have grandpas and grandmas, grandpas and grandmas, grandpas and grandmas only. And it creates a sense of pressure on the ones who are not so, I mean, I would say, accustomed to have that. So it is important. It is important to understand what that's where we are, how we are contributing, how we're doing in order to fit that culture that we are part of it. And that's why, in a way, I think the history and the memory that we have as a, as a community is a welcoming to the migrants. It's always welcoming to the migrants. And if you look into the history, we have people from Europe, we have people from Central America. My grandfather came from Panama, but his family was from Colombia. So we have two rich families here, one from Nicaragua and one from Colombia. It means that okay. I was born here in Boquete. My mother was not, which means she came in. My grandfather who came in was all his life, he was a coffee picker. So also, it was seeing the community as a community of opportunities. Why? Because of coffee, because of the railroad, because of the people that came in, like uh, Monique, the one who is from uh, Finca Lerida, an engineer, Norwegian engineer that built the, I said, the emergency system for one of the locks. I mean, that kind of mind also came in. Well, the people who were biologists studying the volcano, they stayed too. So it's not only to see, it, which is important, it's not only to see that what the age of the people is, but also what are they bringing in, like the geologists. I learned from him. A lot of things that I had no clue. That is a contribution. And then what I'm doing, I'm also passing on. I'm passing it on. I learn something, I pass it on. Because that is what creates the sense of unity. It's something that we build together. And it's something that somebody does. It. It's something that somebody is responsible for. It's, it's us. If you plant one tree, make sure. Somebody will remember that you planted that tree. So plant tree. That's what gave us some life. Um, I'm not sure if we'll contribute to the, change, uh, the climate change, but for sure it's something that will help, even if it is one, because everything starts with one. Okay? I will have some, some other question? Yes. Right here. Right here. Yes, Hi, do you have any information about any, any upcoming uh, infrastructure projects or any projects in downtown Boquete, uh, any improvements or anything like that? There are some that have been, uh, especially because of the touristic side of it. Now, Boquete has been a touristic place even uh, from the Indian time. It's not now that we have tourism. It's always been a place where people come and stays and visits and then just leave. It's, it's, and there was a bigger project that had to do with touristic, uh, the tourism industry, basically, to improve 
some of the infrastructure of Boquete. And that had to do with the water system and the sewer system and the, I mean, um, superficial water system. I mean, there were like four different systems they were working on. And they started that before the, the, the pandemic's time, maybe before last year. And we're still not working yet. So we hope it will work because what is happening is that we not only have the locals, the Indians, the expats, now we also have the tourist people. And with tourist people, when you have this big group coming, they also consume and they also leave things here. So we need to set up the whole infrastructure for that. And it was just in place some of that, uh, since it's been required, that we need to, I mean, if you are promoting this as a destination, come on, present the destination in a way that will produce some good economy. I'm not gonna sell Panama for a cheap country, no. On the contrary, we produce the best coffee of the world, the most expensive coffee of the world, charge for it. That creates economy. That provides jobs for people. What we cannot be doing is no, not paying the coffee growers well. No, the other country. We gotta pay the coffee growers well. So the economy keeps moving. That's what creates the economy. And when we have that's what part that we were talking with the minister is we need first world type of infrastructure. We need good internet, not just this little thing there. Panama is not a big country. It's just that we, we ask for this so we can get a little bit of here, but at least we get some. But it is part of the strategy of the touristic industry um, to promote and help, uh, create all the infrastructure that Boquete needs. And when we have the infrastructure in Boquete, everybody benefits too. So that's still in the process, just because the pandemic just turned around a little bit of everything. And we are learning now how to deal with the touristic industry in another way. You now we get more masks and things like that, more space, and, but it's doable. I mean, human beings have been so creative, so all the time. So we will do it. There is another question there, another question there. Uh, Boquete has always had phenomenal coffee, and I think it's getting more and more publicity worldwide because it truly is exceptional. Uh, but with this weather change, or whatever you want to call it, what do you see, at, well, what is happening now, coffee-wise, and what do you see as the future uh, as for coffee? Okay, the future of the industry in Panama has to do with the capacity that the geography allows us to do. Costa Rica plate has higher elevation, 1,000 meters up, 10 times bigger than Panama. So we could not compete in, in, in volume. There's no way. And the second thing is that Panama has a dollar economy. So we cannot control our own currency. So we cannot compete on price. What is left? To compete on quality. And that's exactly, if you look at the, uh, the movie, that's exactly what moved the whole people to go into it because the prices were so low that we could not survive. There was no way. So, the development of the, of, the, of the real fine coffees started with learning how to cop, because then we knew what we had. Without that, there was no way, no way. Uh, 1977, my father went to Europe, and that time he was already in the business, the family was starting to be in the business too, and when he went, arrived in Spain, he called us and he said, you know, all of you need to learn English. Because it's the only way we can survive in international trade. And it took us five years for all the children to go and learn English in the States. It's understanding what is the key point that needs to be done in order to do the turning point and change everything. And that's what happened. And the first person that learned how to cop, local person that learned how to cop, was me. A woman in a machist world? Well, nothing new. It's part of the life. I'm going to ask Maria the question I ask her every time she does a talk like this. When are you going to be our mayor? Mayor. 
Mayor, I don't know. That's uh, Colin. Yeah, I know. That's part of what we need to do. You know, it is also. But that also changes the part. It is what is happening in what I was going to finish with the coffee is that after we learn, we realize something else. That my father one time I, I asked him before he died, and I said, "Well, Dad, what has been the success of your business?" And he said, "Well, there are three things that you need to pay attention." It didn't take like one minute to think through it, and he said. First of all, take advantage of, a, of the opportunity. You always have opportunity, but take advantage of the opportunity. The second thing is that you get to be prepared for the opportunity. If you're not prepared, it comes and goes. But the most important part is that you can have the opportunity, you can have been prepared for it, but if you don't have collaborators, you will not move. That means you need to teach. And that's what we've done in the coffee industry. And we have reached the level that is global level. We are the ones who are setting the pace here of the global coffee economy. We are writing history. A coffee is a very young industry. It's only, what, a thousand years? Wine, 10,000, tea, I don't know how many thousands. Olive oil, another thousand. Tea is very young, as you could see here. Just started even before, I mean, just in our lifetime, basically. So we are the ones who are writing the history on coffee, global coffee industry, what it means top quality coffees. And it's because we are training our own people. And we train them, so I train somebody to be better than I am, so I can move and be more creative. If we don't think like that, we will not move. We will not move. So that's been the, the key understanding. English and copying. Just two things. It makes the whole big difference. Of course, hard work. It took us 25 years to get where we are today. It's a lifetime. Question? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It's been really good. I have a bunch of questions, but the thing I've been wondering since I moved here is, how is Boquete's uh, electricity generated? Is it hydro or? It's hydro. It's hydro. Yeah. Uh, when the, in the early 1900s, when all these engineers from the Panama came, they also established like three different generators or five different type of generator electricity that were local. When we have the dictatorship, they had this big new program that it was much better to make Fortuna and to make Los Valles, bigger hydropowers, and took away from Boquete all the little ones. So now we have more blackouts than before. I mean, before meaning 50 years ago. When we had all these, and one will just kind of go bad, but you had four more ready to just bump in. With more, with more people moving into the area, which means more demand for electricity, do you know if there's anything planned to, to rebuild some of that hydro infrastructure or, or to deal with It has to be changed things? the way that they do this. It's just that you know that. When you have these big, big infrastructures, they want to control everything. They are trying to promote uh, the last, I think, the last 10 years. They are trying to promote people that have capacity to be able to fit the system. Like we have the power here from uh, Arcoiris. They have a generator, generator capacity there. They fit it into the system. But it's only one out of four that used to be here in Boquete. The problem with that is that it goes to the central system. And then when something happens, we have no electricity. So now there are more incentives also to go into solar systems and other ways of producing energy. So all that is new. Now, remember one thing. A major, major changer of game is technology. That is a major change. So when we have technology coming in, things start to change faster too. So that's, I mean, the cheaper the solar technology comes, the more usage you're going to have. There is the normal, normal economy of every change. So looking more at renewables. 
understand. Yes, and also being more, let's say, uh, understanding what is the capacity that you have. And it's the same like when people were asking, okay, why do we have no? Why don't we have water? I mean, drinking water. Well, yes, because you were on the top of the mountains. Most of us are down in the mountain because on the top is higher to move water up. But if you have the money to pump it up, you will be able to pump up. Uh, but the ones that we don't have the money to pump up, we need to use just a normal system. So it's just understanding what are the interactions with what we have. This is this is the topography that we have. And then is understanding that will also help you to understand, okay, where are you buying your house? Why? Many people buy the house because it has a beautiful view and no water, a lot of wind, and no electricity. <laughs> and then complain because Boquete doesn't answer because there is no water. Keep calling the mayor, the mayor never shows up. Keep calling the corregidor, never shows up. Keep... What a backward town. No, no, it's not a backward town. We need to understand what is the nuances of the, all this infrastructure that we have and why we have it. Uh, I remember the first time that I noticed all the people building by the river. And we thought, oh my goodness, what a headache. Why? Because it increases the risk. And increases the risk of the people and increases the risk of the infrastructure too. Because we start pressing for more infrastructure. Even with the government, we keep telling them, don't build bigger roads. Why? Because bigger roads create more superficial water. More superficial water on the top, a lot of water on the bottom. And that happened quite a bit of time already. Here in Boquete, just the last two years maybe, three years, could you see just totally flooded houses. Water right up here. Why? Well, because they, they don't understand that it rains in Boquete, but it rains not like chiki 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 bajareque. When it rains, it pours. And then it's just one hour, and everything just goes up. So, listen to the people. That's all what it takes. Just listen to the people. All right? Some other questions? Comments? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>